Hello everybody. Welcome back to Chit Chat and Tea with Amanda Marie. I hope you guys are all doing good out there. I am back with another episode in my narcissism series. We are going to be, we're really getting toward the end here with this series. Um, probably two more episodes I'm thinking and I'm going to be able to finish this up. Um, so I'm, it's been quite the journey. Um, really, I've learned so much from this book. I always like to show the book. The first will be last, A Biblical Perspective on Narcissism by DC Robertson. And I am so thrilled, guys. Um, my last episode that I put up on my channel I'm up, I'm over 700 views on that, which for me, that is huge. Like that's a big deal for me. I rarely, I think that might be actually the most views I've ever gotten on one of my videos. Um, besides like a sh one of my shorts, you know, I've gotten more views on some of my shorts, but on like a video, that's the most I've ever gotten. So I am like, praise God that is so I'm so excited about it guys again I don't know why sometimes I get like a bunch of views like that and then sometimes I don't I don't understand it but I'm just grateful f that it when it happens and it's exciting that so many people are hearing this truth from a biblical perspective about this issue of narcissism because again it is such a prevalent issue in our world right now and I truly believe that it's something that we need to we we need to understand so we can navigate through it um, without getting you know caught in the web that it creates um, and God's word is, you know, the best place to go for answers, right? So before I get into this, you know, what we dive into the book again, I want to say welcome to anybody new out there. Um, and I want to say if you haven't subbed, consider subbing. Um, I would love for you to join the Chit Chat and Tea family. Um, hit that bell because every time I upload a new video, you will get notified if you hit that bell and like, if you like this video, share, comment. I'm always, always looking forward to hearing from you guys feedback. I love feedback. So in saying all of that, let's get into this. So I left off last time, um, and we, we discussed, hold on, one <clears throat> okay, so where we left off last time, we were discussing, can basically like, I titled it, can love break through to these people? Can God's love break through to them? The answer at the end of the day is yes, of course, God's love can break through to these people. Now it is a miracle I, I want to acknowledge that, that it, it is a miracle if, if, you know, when they do receive that breakthrough. Okay. Um, and we discussed that and we discussed, you know, um, he went through different examples and in the Bible of different people, like for example, the, for example, the apostle Paul is a wonderful example of God's, you know, love really breaking through to Paul, who, uh, you know, how he went from Saul to Paul. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about putting God in the correct place in our lives. You know, they, these people tend to make themselves their own God, you know, and you have, they have to adjust that and put God in his proper place. Okay. So we went through all of that. 
Now we're going to talk, we're going to start out today's video and we're going to talk about what he calls overcome entrenched strongholds. Okay. So overcoming patterns of thinking. God can shine his blazing, overwhelming light into someone's heart and mind for a radical change to walk down a new path. However, this person may still have entrenched patterns of thinking that hinder a straight and unencumbered walk forward. This, these mental strongholds can be labeled a variety of things, but Paul describes them in this way. But you do not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on a new self, which in the likeness, hold on a second, let me turn the page of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. That's from Ephesians 4, 20 through 24. That is why Paul told the Roman to be renewed in the spirit of their minds, to change from the pattern of lies to the pattern of truth, built upon the Bible and enabling God's spirit. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Romans 12, 2. There is a place for constant renewing process, like the stream of a waterfall that over time smooths the rocks below. But there is also a need to actively battle wayward heart attitudes and thoughts based on old lies you still repeat to yourself. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Second Corinthians three ten three through five. While the renewing of the mind is a general process, taking every thought capti captive is a precise attack on specific thoughts. From the, from the analogy of washing clothes, renewing the mind is the general wash and taking every thought captive is specifically scrubbing out those stubborn stains. To do this, you have to identify the specific stain and attack it with vigor. Identify which thoughts are particularly errant and attack them with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, Galatians 5. For those seeking to do this, a structured process might be helpful for checking the errant thoughts with an eye toward redirecting those thoughts toward truth, true truth. Enlist someone to help with this process. Ecclesiastics 4, 9 through 10 reads, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is no not another one to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. One excellent book on this subject is Paul Tripp's Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands, People in Need of Change, Helping People in Need of Change. Help might also come through the right kind of counseling. This would mean a counselor who lovingly and gently holds up biblical truth as a measure against what a recovering narcissist is thinking. It could also incorporate a counselor's helping the recovering narcissist with the structured process mentioned. These are similarities between the structured process and counseling technique called cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. As we discussed at the beginning of the book, secular psychology has a few elements with surface similarities to a biblical approach. This was the case as we described the traits and tactics of narcissists. It is also the case with CBT. Okay, so basically, you know, he goes into this CBT approach. So he's basically saying like, you know, this is another way to help the narcissist um, with that breakthrough. They need to renew their minds, right? They need to start, like he said, taking those, those lies that the enemy puts in uh, in your mind um, and taking them captive so he can renew his mind and align it with the mind of Christ, okay? And now he's saying that, you know, there if you go to counseling, that could help as long as it's a counselor 
that is going to adhere to biblical worldview, biblical truths, okay, which I want to reiterate that is so important. If you are going to go to a counselor, any kind of therapy, you know, counseling, I, you know, would definitely, you know, want to stay within counselors that are um, Bible believers, okay? Um, I'm going to kind of skip over this, this part where he's just talking about um, the counseling, you know, section. Um, um, overcoming, um, and now he's saying overcoming other types of bondage. Um, overcoming entrenched sin patterns includes an, o an ongoing element of deliverance and freedom, okay? The ultimate deliverance and the foundation for all deliverance was provided to us through Christ, Jesus Christ. For he rescued us from the dom domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, Colossians 1.13. However, it is possible that the narcissist in his former pursuits has opened a door for lingering a lingering satanic stronghold. Peter said to Ananias, a genuine believer, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back some of the price of the land? That's from Acts 5.3. The subject is beyond the scope of this book. If you would like to pursue this further, I would recommend a book, Spiritual Warfare, Christians, Demonization and Deliverance by Carl Payne as a great starting point. Okay. Um, choices. At the end of the day, everyone makes conscious or unconscious choices on how they approach the problems of their lives. We have presented a fundamentally different framework from the secular world for the possible causes and solutions of narcissism. This framework based on God's ancient wisdom in the Bible differs substantially from the relatively recent framework of secular psychology. If you sincerely want to take God's path, he will guide you. Um, who is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way he should choose. He, his soul will abide in prosperity. His descendants will inherit the land. The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him and he will make them know his covenant. Psalm 25, 12 through 14. May the Lord give you faith, wisdom, and grace in your choices walking forward. Okay. So that was just to wrap up kind of the where I left off from that last video, the breakthrough um, part of it, okay? Can God's love break through to these narcissists and, you know, their path to um, a genuine path to change for these people and what that might look like? So, you know, that's wrapping that section of the book up, okay? Um, and now we're going to move on to, and like he said, guys, though, honestly, truly, everyone makes conscious or unconscious choices. At the end of the day, it's about a choice that that person needs to make, right? God gave us free will. We're not robots, okay? He chose to give us free will because he didn't want robots. He didn't want us to just be programmed to worship him and love him and follow him. He wanted it to be genuine and come from our heart, deep in our hearts, to love him and worship him and obey him. Just like if you have your husband or your wife, you know, you want your husband or your wife to love you because they want to love you, because they love you, not because they were forced to love you or because somebody made them like say, this is going to be, you have no choice. You have to love this person. You know, you don't have a choice in the matter. They want to, you know, feel your, the love that you, you're, they're choosing you 
to be you know they want they 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 could be with somebody else but they don't want to be with somebody else they want to be with you right um it's the same with god like so at the end of the day it's like they need to make that choice and say i choose god i choose to repent i choose to change my way that i think i choose to let you know let god come into my heart and and soften my heart and help me to renew my mind and to renew my you know um my heart and everything and make me a new creature okay <clears throat> and we all have that choice to make right we all have that choice to make okay so next section coping with narcissist now this part is more for the people that not necessarily the narcissist themselves but the people that have to deal with these people right that my hands are just all like i keep doing some weird stuff like getting caught up in my hair and i'm just ugh, whatever um it's one of those days guys okay so we have identified the core biblical picture of a narcissist yes we have we're on episode 11 and if you've got, I, I, I keep forgetting to do this too, to say this in these videos, guys, this is episode 11. It's in my playlist on my channel is learning about narcissism. You're going to see all the other episodes that I've done on this book. Okay. And yes, we have really gotten a good picture clues on causes, a path to genuine change, right? How the narcissist can, what that process looks like. These can all be helpful starting points, but what wisdom does the Bible provide on how to relate to them? The popular psychology world of books, blogs, and the common sections of articles almost universally provide simplistic advice to go no contact or low contact with a narcissist. There are certain times and situations where low contact I've never heard the term low contact, honestly. I've heard no contact because I'm I'm living no contact. Um, matches biblical counsel, okay? However, the Bible has a much more comprehensive and nuanced approach that tailors its counsel to a broader range of specific situations and brings God into the equation. Okay, I'm really curious, guys, for this section to see what he's going to say. God's responsibility and ours. When we are in a difficult situation or relationship with a narcissist, we experience significant anger, stress, frustration, often from our own attempt to fix both the situation and the narcissist. However, as one who seeks to dominate others and as one who will not accept any reproof, a narcissist will fight hard against any attempts to be fixed. Much of this is beyond our ability to control. One part of walking forward is to identify our responsibility versus God's responsibility. This difference is key to peace in a difficult situation. David clearly understood this. <clears throat> oh Lord, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters or in things too difficult for me. Surely I have composed and quieted my soul like a weaned child rests against his mother. My soul is like a weaned child within me. <clears throat> That's from Psalm 131, 1 through 2. Great matters is a typical biblical understatement for the things under God's wisdom, power, and rule. God is the designer and the creator, orchestrator, and sustainer of everything. Things too difficult for me includes our attempts to accomplish whatever is God's burden. David said, I am not going to get involved in God's job. And the results was a great measure of peace. There are certain things that we are responsible for and can and should do. However, God's responsibility is the bigger portion. What is God's job in dealing with a narcissist? God is the one who can, number one, defend us and our reputations. Number two, because remember, guys, they one of the big moves the narcissist does is to destroy people's reputations. Remember, I talked about this. I don't know. I think I said, yeah, I did the smear campaign. 
that they go on when you have done something to upset them, okay? Number two, to orchestrate situations to counteract the narcissist actions, okay? Number three, give us times of res respite, respite, sorry, respite during the spiritual battle. Number four, change or humble the narcissist. Number five, weave the situation together for our good. Number six, execute judgment on the narcissist while protecting us from those consequences. Okay. Leaving these in his hands frees us to focus on our job, which is to, number one, put on the full armor of God. Number two, pursue the fruit of the spirit. Number three, love God and man. Number four, live in peace. One way to summarize our responsibility is in Micah. He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God, Micah 6, 8. No matter how hard he tries, the narcissist in the end cannot prevent God from doing his job and cannot keep us from doing our real job, doing justice, loving kindness, walking humbly with God. The narcissist cannot control you talking to God. No, they can't. <laughs> and the narcissist cannot control you speaking truth to yourself. The narcissist cannot interfere with your own personal love relationship with God. Protect yourself. Okay. God's responsibility versus our responsibility is nice in theory, but what can I do to constructively manage my own situation? There are several practical and wise actions available. However, it is important to match the appropriate practical action to the situation. Instead of the non-biblical advice that Christians are to be nice, be nice, the Bible uses stronger language such as Paul's admission. Okay, Be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14. I like that. I like that verse. And Jesus directly instructed us on how to approach living among predators. He said, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be shrewd as serpents, innocent as doves. Matthew 10, 16. We need to recognize the wolves in our midst those who would seek to take advantage of us and to do us harm. Our response should not be to res respond in kind. Our, I'm sorry, our response should not be, yeah, to, to respond in kind, acting as wolves ourselves, but instead to handle the challenges and threats through superior wisdom. How do we get this wisdom? Well, by asking for it and by seeking it. Okay. Prepare for the real fight. After we have asked for wisdom and started seeking it, where do we go next? Realize this is a battle with spiritual dimensions. We need to bring God into the equation and begin with the weapons and protection that he has made available to us. These are outlined in Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, and using the imagery of the, of the day are called the armor of God. Okay, and that reads, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist that in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. The lies of Satan, and by extension, the narcissist emulating him, can be like a sword or a knife stabbing us right into the gut. 
Gird our loins means putting protection around our core being that lies cannot penetrate and cause their damage. That protection against lies is the truth. The only genuinely effective way to counter a lie. If the very core of our being is strengthened with truth, if we are speaking truth to ourselves and others, we will be far less wounded by the lies coming straight at us. His truth, ultimately from the Bible and not just from what we ourselves or others are telling us, confirms our worth and our value before him. Narcissists prey on those with a sensitive conscience, without hesitation, as those who are more susceptible to manipulation. But in general, walking righteously allows us to boldly walk forward in the face of an onslaught from a narcissist. This speaks to the ability to walk forward during attacks by having a clear, positive purpose for your life, a purpose of sharing the good news, a peace between God and man, and the resulting peace between man and man. Satan's schemes to attack and defeat people are called here flaming arrows. That's from, um, he's still going through, you know, speaking of the Ephesians. Verse 16, okay, 6, Ephesians 6, verse 16. Um, the shield against these scheming attacks is faith or belief in God, his existence, his nature, his unchangeable love for us, his wisdom, his sovereignty, his power, his forgiveness, his wonderful eternal purposes which flow from his heart of love. How is this relevant to defending against attacks from our narcissist? As we stated in verse 12, attacks from people are attacks from Satan. The world is full of people with evil in their hearts who are beating each other up with the most mostly their words and sometimes their actions, but it is mostly words from the narcissist, right? Behind it is the God of this world. The shield of faith is very relevant to defend against attacks from the narcissist. The most fundamental piece of our armor, true salvation through Christ has two aspects. First, it's the reality of being in God's kingdom and with God as the king leading the battle against the onslaught of evil. Second, it is knowing that as citizens of his kingdom, whatever happens to us under his loving care, wisdom, and power, and that at the end of it all, we will be victorious with him in heaven. If we have only defense, if we if we have only defensive armor, we are spending our lives simply defending off attacks from Satan. Not a fun position. Being on offense as part of God's kingdom only not only serves his ultimate purpose of people coming into the fullness of life in his kingdom, but gives us a positive reason for being in the battle. It helps us to uh, focus not just on ourselves, but on high, much larger, more eternal purposes of people coming in a love relationship with him and others. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, that was great. You know, put on the full armor of God. Always be, and and what he spoke of with that, like, their big, one of their biggest weapons that they use against us is their lies. Their lies that they spew at you, you know, um, to hurt you, to make you doubt yourself, make you, you know, to try to destroy relationships your reputation, whatever it is that's going on and having that truth around your core being and ha being covered in God's truth of who you are, you know, to God and in God, in Christ, that protects you from those lies. Okay. I love that. Guard against their deception. Since deception is one of the primary tools of the narcissist, prudently guarding against it is foundational. We cannot prevent them from lying to us and attempting to deceive us. They will speak according to their na internal nature and God will hold them accountable for their lies. However, there are things we can do. How can we defeat lies with truth? Like I just said, with the truth, right? Like he stated. 
When a narcissist tells uh, lies to tear you down or deceive you or even flatter you for the sake of gaining an advantage over you, speak truth to your own heart as a counter to those lies. The ultimate question is, what does God say about the situation as opposed to what the lying narcissist is saying about it? Saturate yourself in the truth as a general protection against the lies. Saturation with truth will provide an automatic lie alert, lie alert, lie alert. I like that. And protection against lies coming your way, which you may not be expecting or for which you may be unprepared. This is particularly important as a defense against the narcissist's subtle attempts to destroy your self-worth as a part of his drive to exalt himself. And what comes to mind is another more like secular psychology or even it might even be put into the pop psychology category is gaslighting. Um, these people love to gaslight people, right? Where they spew their lies at you and, you know, make you believe the lies and make you question your own mind your own like thoughts right like you know you go and you say to them you know you really hurt me when you said this to me when you when you spoke so harshly to me or you um you know I really needed you to be there for me and you weren't and they gaslight you. What are you talking about? You never, I never said that to you. I didn't make, I didn't do that. I didn't, I didn't make you feel like that. I didn't say that. And then you start to question yourself like, what? You did, you did, you know, speak harshly to me. You did, um, you know, you weren't there for me when I needed you, you know, that's the gaslighting. Okay. Third, realize that knowing and speaking truth to ourselves will provide a measure of freedom from the change, the lie chains, the lie teller is seeking for us. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. John 8, 31 through 32. I'm going to take a little sip of my tea. Actually, <clears throat> my tea is gone. <laughs> so let me take a sip of my water. Thank you. Okay. Oh, that tastes good. Um... Jesus was speaking of the ultimate freedom and the salvation from the penalty of sin that comes from knowing the truth about him. And there is a sub-application of his statement that results in freedom from specific points of bondage that come from believing anything counter to his true truth. Fourth, understand that there is a time and a place for speaking public truth against a narcissist's lies. Okay. Jesus spoke the word against the lies of Satan when he was tempted in the wilderness. There is a wise way to, and a time to do it. Narcissists will fight back hard against truth, which exposes their lies. Therefore, <clears throat> sorry, I'm having like, <clears throat> like, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> like, I think it's allergies, guys. My throat just feels kind of like been trying to clear my throat all day. <clears throat> Sorry. Therefore, we need to wield that sword wisely and skillfully. Let truth defend you against the attacks. Practically speaking, when a narcissist speaks lies to you to tear you down, deceive you, or flatter you for the sake of gaining advantage over you, speaking the true truth is to yourself, also to others, will be the biggest protection you have against their attempts to harm you. We are not just talking about invoking our own opinions and labeling them the truth, but seeking to get as close as possible to real reality, which is, in the end, the truth which comes from God. Okay, very good point. Yes. <clears throat> Do not rely on a narcissist's inflated false claims. 
Hmm. Like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts of his gifts falsely. Proverbs 25, 14. As a word picture from an Aragrayan time, clouds and wind without rain may not mean much today to us urbanites, but to a farmer looking for the crucial rain needed for a successful crop, clouds and winds are a sign that the necessary rain should be coming soon, then hoped for a needed benefit results in disappointment if the rain doesn't arrive. This paints a picture of the folly of relying on a narcissist's false boastings. The gifts mentioned in Proverbs 25, 14 refer to something the boaster is promising to bring. It could be a physical gift, possibly even the application of his time, energy, and talent to, to a need. In boasting falsely, the narcissist is promising something he will not deliver either in the gift of being less than he is advertising or by not following through at all. As he boasts about the gift he will bring, he either knows he can't deliver or he's lying or thinks he is able to deliver when he can't and is delusional about the gap between what he is promising and its lesser reality. In a narcissist's never-ending quest to seek the praise of man, he will likely overstate his ability to deliver what he is promising so if you rely on that boasting you could likely wind up like the farmer that does not receive the rain he's looking for this is also referred to in psalm 40 you will be blessed if you do not rely on the proud so yes and i know we've covered this in past episodes they are very delusional very delusional people okay um yeah. Whew. So fact checking everything. And as a narcissist is notorious, notoriously unreliable, it is important to, um, to fact check what comes out of their mouth rather than accept what they say at face value. In biblical days, before the extensive ability of written sources, the principal means for doing this was to get two or three witnesses today there are other ways to fact check but two or three witnesses is always a good principle narcissists tend to exaggerate their skills their accomplishments their track record commitment to cause etc they will also stretch the truth or outright lie to get what they want they will without hesitation trash the reputation of those who get in their way so while this basic basic biblical principle of confirming things instead of believing everything you are told is always appropriate it is especially applicable applicable when dealing with the narcissist learn not to trust man one prime way to guard against the deception is through not engaging with them at the heart level while our heart desires to find soulmates with whom we can deeply share there are times when we need to guard our hearts this is very true People came to him and they um, fawned, all, fawned all over him, but he knew what was in their heart. He's speaking of Jesus here, okay? He knew people were fickle and can quickly turn away, and he did not entrust himself to them. Once we understand the guile in the heart of a narcissist, we can then learn to guard our hearts and not be taken in by their deceptive approaches. However, we are not to close our hearts off to all people. Paul said in Corinthians, you are our letter written in our hearts, known and read by all men. 2 Corinthians 3.2 However, guarding our hearts has a place as a narcissist will attempt to worm their way in for the purpose of being number one. Learn when and how to avoid them. Okay. Um, the prime advice for pop, from pop psychology world is to go no contact or low contact, right? While this has occasional merit, biblical wisdom is more no... I feel like I already read this. Maybe he's just repeating himself. While this has an occasional merit, biblical wisdom is more nuanced. The correct response depends on our relationship to the narcissist as well as our responsibilities. By this point in this book, it should be obvious why we need to carefully manage our interface 
with a narcissist. Their goal is to be the center and the Lord of our universe, even to the point of replacing God in our lives. Right. They don't only want to put, they're putting themselves as God in their own lives. They want to make you put them as God in your life and heart too. Right. They want, because hello, like, at the end of the day, who was the first narcissist? Lucifer, Satan. He was the first narcissist. And what does he do? What is Satan? What what is Satan's purpose? He wants to be like God. Right? He wants to be God. He wants to be worshipped like God. He wants to be looked at like he's God. So what does he tempt man with? He tempts man with the lie. You can be like God. You can be God. You can be just like God too. Right? Okay. Their goal, right? I said their goal is to be the center of your replacing God in our lives. In no case should we allow that to happen. Consider the following guideposts for deciding how and when to avoid them. Avoid them generally. Okay. Paul gives us an alarming description of the state of man's hearts in the last days, including clear narcissistic traits. After his dis description, Paul tells Timothy to avoid men such as these. So let's read this. Guys, The light we're having the light problem again. Um, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come for men will be lovers of self. Lovers of money, boastful, arrogant re revelers, disobedient to the parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pre pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. This is in general a general principle for dealing with narcissists. Let them engage the evil in their hearts on their own. Don't go to extremes, but simply leave them be. As Jesus said in Matthew 15, 14, regarding the Pharisees, leave them alone. Don't engage. We are not required to disturb our peace through entanglement with such people. Amen. 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 That's it right there. The Holy Spirit literally one time told me about one of the narcissists in my life because there are several honestly that I've had in my life at different seasons in my life that I've dealt with was dealing with you know what I mean one time though I was praying about a certain person in a certain situation and the Holy Spirit literally gave me the put the words now you know in me steer clear steer clear steer clear of this person that's what the holy spirit told me to do um look ahead to avoid them part of implementing the general ad and this that was before i even had the language that i have now i really didn't understand all this narcissist stuff this was a this was this was probably you know not 20 years ago, but close to 20 years ago, like 16, 17 years ago. Okay. Part of implementing the general admonish, admonition, what is that word? All right. Hold on a second, guys. Okay. Sorry. It's admonition. I'm sorry. I don't know why. I just, my brain wasn't registering that word. Okay, part of implementing the general admonition above is to see an upcoming train wreck and get out of the way. Proverbs says the prudent sees the evil and hides himself, but the naive go on and are punished for it. Proverbs 22, 3. Yes, being prudent is a good thing, not a bad thing. You know, I've been called a prude, you know, and it's like almost like I've been called a prude and it's like it, it's an insult towards me. And I say, hey, I don't take that as an insult. The Bible says to be prudent. 
right? That's to me is not an insult. Of course, it has a negative connotation nowadays, you know. A naive person says, oh, it will be okay, and blindly goes forward, but they will pay the price for their naivete. When a narcissist turns on the charm to win you over, it is very tempting to buy what they are selling. This could happen in several contexts, including dating in a relationship or the job interview or hiring process. Or it could simply be a narcissist trying to befriend you. This will provide a true test of your wisdom and prudence. While the narcissist uses his maximum skills of deception and charm to win us over, we need to counter with the best radar possible. I personally am quite naive and want to see the best in people. Okay. And a lot of people are like that. We, you know, especially as believers, as Christians, we want to see the best in people, right? I know like that was a big thing for me, you know, I want to see the best in people, you know, and I really, I can understand that. Sorry, I have to, fi I have to find where I left off now. <laughs> um... Learning prudence has been a long lifetime process. However, we are admonished to do it. So yes, guys, we need to be prudent. Amen. We need to be, you know, we need to be careful. We need to guard our heart. We need to be wise. We need to, you know, use discernment in dealing with people. Avoid them in the hiring process. Ooh. Oh, Lord, have mercy. My husband is going through a, a situation right now, guys, with this exact problem. With, yeah. If anybody's willing to pray for my husband in his job situation with this issue, I'm not going to give details. God knows the, pro the, the whole story. If you would be willing to lift him up, his name's Brian, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. One application for this principle is in the hiring process. The best way to deal with a narcissist in the workplace is to keep them out of your company or off your team. I'm going to have my husband read this tonight. But not hiring a narcissist can be difficult because they are experts at favorably presenting themselves in the interview. Yes, they are. We've talked about this in the past they are actors academy award time oscars time the interviewing process is typically brief enough that it is hard to sort fact from fiction there are simple tests you can administer to quickly discover how a narcissist a prospective employee or team member may be okay this is i'm really this is good while not exhaustive or definitive, they can provide a clue to narcissistic tendencies. I once hired someone due to external pressure and a language barrier and subsequently administered a 10 question test. Here we go. Discovering regrettably that they were an extreme narcissist. Since I had already made the commitment, I went ahead and it was an unmitigated disaster. I was not prudent and was punished for it. Avoid them within the... Oh, I thought he was going to give us the test. <laughs> I thought he was going to give us... I was going to take this home to my husband and be like, you know, here. <laughs> but that is... See, if you're not prudent, like the Bible told us in Proverbs, the prudent sees the evil and hides himself, but the naive go on and are punished for it. Avoid them within the church. Ooh. How much more, guys? Because I know I'm, I'm going long. I'm going long. I know. Guys. Lord. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the church issue is such a big one. Such a big one. There are several um, admonitions within the church for dealing with these people. Paul said to keep your eye on your eye on. Ooh, keep your eye on. Keep your eye on <laughs> them and turn away from them. 
Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you've learned and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Romans 16, 17 through 18. They cause dissension. They teach in ways contrary to sound doctrine. They are slaves of their own appetites. They deceive people with smooth and flattering speech. While not everyone with these traits is a narcissist, narcissists tend to have them though. If we apply the given instruction to them, we will respond appropriately. We will keep an eye on them, be alert for them. Turn away from them individually. Avoid them. Collectively, do not let them influence your church. This is, an important, this is important because it enables us to avoid the consequences and turmoil that surrounds them. But more importantly, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. If we do not recognize them and avoid them, we risk becoming deceived, disastrously living according to their false um, ways of thinking. Jesus said to let them alone. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if the blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into a pit. If you allow yourselves to be led by a blind narcissist, Jesus, Pharisees, or Paul's deceivers, you will remain blind and fall into the same pit. It is important to understand the context with which in within which this instruction was given, that of relating to others in the church. How we deal with narcissists greatly depends upon the nature of the relationship with them. Narcissists lack judgment and perspective and are blind to so many things. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize it was like this. Um, because of their ability to convince other, others and their prideful sense that they should lead others, they find other people they can lead. Sorry. Oop. The ones they attract are naive themselves and they're blind. The narcissists lead their blind followers into a pit of trouble. Yes. Create space in a family context. Avoiding them becomes more delicate in the context of family relationships. Yes, it does. On the one hand, you need space, but on the other hand, you have certain God-given responsibilities. Your level of familial responsibilities will generally de uh, dictate the extent to which you can avoid a narcissistic family member. Within wisdom and creativity and through prayer, God sh can show the way. The Bible illustrates this concept in creating space. Through Proverbs wisdom on dealing with a contentious woman, pride is genderless and men and women can be equally contentious. So the following is not intended to pick on women, but to illustrate a principle that can also apply in reverse. A constant dripping on, on a day of steady rain and a contentious woman are alike. Woman is alike. He who would restrain her restrains the wind and grasps oil with his right hand. Proverbs 27, 15 through 16. This woman is contentious, contentiousness in her nature. You cannot stop her from being contentious. And it is not something you can talk through with her to stop her. You might as well hold back the wind. You never know what will set off the next conflict. She does not accept that she is contentious. And trying to get her to understand change is like, what she is doing is trying to grab a handful of oil, as it says in Proverbs. Uh, conversely, you you have God-given responsibilities. How can you fulfill them with someone driven to dominate you? The essence of range of possible solutions is to let her have her conflicts in her own space. While you focus on God, your God-given responsibilities, seek God for your emotional needs and trust him in the work on your behalf in ways in large and small. Understand your responsibility versus God's. In addition, create space which allows you to measure of avoiding, a measure of avoiding while not neglecting your responsibilities. It is better to live in a corner of a roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Um, find your version of the corner of the roof and make use of it. In the days of Proverbs, the roofs were flat and exposed with stairs leading to them. One interpretation of Proverbs 21.9 was that it was better to be outside and exposed to the elements than inside and exposed to the, the abuse of a contentious and quarrelsome wife. Be creative in creating or finding your corner of the roof and when, when to use it. It is not a hiding place, but rather a place to go get centered and creatively fulfill a God-given purpose. The corner of the roof in 1000 BC would have been a possible work area. 
Consider that uh, creating space might include scheduling space, managing your schedule, vice, advice, uh, your partner's schedule to get a little breathing room. So basically, I mean, he's going into that and obviously he's really addressing like husband wife situations. I think they're okay. Um, and I'm not even going to get into like that whole thing like you know if you're married to a narcissist like what do you do should you get a divorce you know um so many christians are so like divided over the whole divorce thing and and all of that and 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 you know, I'm not going to, and he's obviously kind of, honestly, he's, he's, unless he gets more in depth later, but I think that he's almost kind of like, um, avoiding it a little bit, you know, he's in, he, you know, obviously he's, he's saying, pointing to that scripture in Proverbs, you know, um, nobody wants to live in a house where the person you're with you know your husband your wife it's it's constant conflict it's constant contention it's you don't know <coughs> if it's gonna be you know a pro like something's gonna happen or the person's gonna blow up or you're like walking on eggshells all the time you know um but yeah i mean you just have to you know every again i've said this before like every situation is unique I do believe there are cases where you, you can't stay, you know, you can't stay <clears throat> in the situation. You need to s at least separate and then let the Lord guide you from there, you know, but the Lord does allow for divorce in extreme situations. You know, he does. Okay. Some people may not agree with that. I understand that, but I've done very in-depth studies on this myself because <clears throat> I myself had to go through a divorce when I was young, you know, many, many years ago. I think I was 20. Well, I got married when I was 20. And I was, div I, I actually, it's a long story, but we were, we weren't together. We only, we were only together for a couple of years and I had my oldest son and, um, you know, it was a nightmare. It was hell. But again, like there are, my case was a very extreme, extreme case. He was an MPD. He is an MPD even still today. And he was physically abusive, mentally abusive. He was a drug addict. He was um, unfaithful. So all of the above, he was not providing for me and my son, um, you know, everything else. So um, like I said, I believe that in extreme cases, you really don't have a choice. You don't have a choice, okay? There are some cases. Now, I'm going to end it here, guys. I'm going to wrap this up. And next video will be the last video. Okay. This, in this, will be, we're going to conclude this on the next episode. Um, but, you know, going back to that for a minute, there are some cases where, you know, it, your life isn't in danger and the person's not cheating or they're not like, you know, physically abusing you or, or things like this. Um, so like he's saying, like, like it says in Proverbs, you know, I mean, I think that is some good advice. Like find yourself, you know, take steps to give yourself space from that person, you know, and have that person have their space and you have your space kind of thing. And, and obviously the hope and the prayer is as you call on the Lord and as the Lord's working on your own, you're focusing on your own walk with the Lord, your own 
you know, working out your own salvation with the Lord, that you're praying and lifting that person up for the Lord to, you know, penetrate their heart and convict their heart and soften their heart through the process that needs to happen, right? <clears throat> through sanctification, through, you know, the humbling process that needs to happen. And so that certainly can apply to some situations. Okay, guys. Um, again, every situation is unique. But I love that he covered that, you know, we are called to avoid these people. Um, avoid them generally, like he said. And he pointed out the scriptures. Learn when and how to avoid them. Um, don't trust them you know so I mean this is what the Bible says that's the thing this is what the Word of God says Christianity today is so watered down you know the the Western Christian Church okay um, is so lukewarm and it's so watered down that you know believe me I've talked to people in the past about my personal situation and like I've stated like there are many MPDs in my life that I, I have in my life I don't know why I've said this before why the Lord you know has allowed so many of them to be in my life but there are and I've had to I've been forced to understand this because of it because literally it's been devastating to my life and I've talked to people about this, you know, friends through the years or whatever people in my churches, you know, and things like this that I've gone to. And when I, whenever I have said to some people, I'm like, I had to go no contact or whatever. They just don't get it. They don't get it. And, um, you know, I'm looked at as the cruel person. I'm looked at as this like unforgiving grudge holding hard hearted person and it's like no that's not the case you know and 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 again like it's such a there's such a misunderstanding you know because like he said like you know oh just be nice to them just just be nice um that's not going to work like that doesn't that's not what it, you're literally dealing with the devil. You're, you're dealing with the devil. Okay. And I've tried to explain this to people and they just don't get it. A lot of people don't get it. If you haven't dealt with this and this, this evilness. Okay. You don't understand. I'm sorry. You just, you don't. And then the judgment gets passed on me, someone like me, who I'm proclaiming to be a believer in Jesus Christ, and I'm proclaiming to be all these things, yet then they hear, they're like, oh, you have no contact with this person? What? Oh my gosh, what's wrong with you? Oh, uh, 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 you know, that's not right. Like, what kind of Christian is are you, you know? And, but yet, in the word of God, I just shared it with you guys. You you guys heard me read all those scriptures and shared it. It states to avoid these people, to stay away from these people, to stay clear of these people, to watch out for these people, okay? And to guard yourself against these people. So praise God, like this is, this is exactly why I was so drawn to this book because and I, I feel like every Christian should read this book, honestly. Like, this is such an awesome book that just really gives us the scripture, scripture after scripture after scripture to confirm this truth, to stand firm on this, that, you know, you're not dealing with just a person who's being mean or rude or whatever you're dealing with demonic entities working through these people um like i said the 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 battle is of not of the flesh it's a spiritual battle of dark in dark places okay of with darkness that's what we're dealing with here 
Um, and it just, it really, I, I, I'm really feeling, um, you know, vindicted right now. I'm just really feeling, um, maybe that wasn't the right word, but I'm really feeling validated by reading this because, uh, you know, I've said for years to people like, you know, this is what I had to do. I had to do this you know, and I've questioned myself so many times and then I've turned around and I went back and tried to, to, uh, you know, help this person again, because that's the right Christian thing to do and let them back into my life again. And then I got stabbed in the gut again and I've got, I got, you know, punished because I wasn't prudent. Like it said, be prudent in your dealings with these people, right? So I am bound, I am determined, I am prudent, and I am I am set that the Lord, you know, He He is He understands, He's given me His orders. This is what you need to do. You know, and that again. It doesn't mean you don't love that person. It doesn't mean you don't pray for that person daily. It doesn't mean you don't lift them in prayer. And you don't hope and hope and hope that the Lord's going to break through them, break through their hardened hearts, right? Of course, we always, always, always do that. We went over that in the last video and I got emotional because I love these people, okay? It's just that right now I've done like you get to a point where you can do everything you can do as far as just like helping them, you know, whether it's giving them money or helping them like speaking, you know, sitting and talking with them and counseling them or letting them stay with you or letting them, you know, spending your time and your energy on them. You get to a point where it's just, it's not working and all they're doing is deceiving you, manipulating you, using you, you know, trying to find ways to destroy you and your, your relationships or whatever. The, so you have to go no contact for self-preservation, right? You have to go no contact. But that's when you just ramp up the prayer. You know, it's prayer time. And that's what you're giving to that person. That's how you're blessing that person. You're lifting them up before the Father, okay? So guys, I'm gonna end it here. I think that was a lot to take in. I was mostly just me reading. Um, to you guys. And like I said, I'm going to put my little marker here for next time. And I'm going to finish this book next time. Okay. I hope you guys are all doing good out there. We went, you know, we went from light to dark again. <laughs> um, and guys, I love you guys. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned for the next episode coming soon. And until next time, guys, God bless.